Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, and it is one verse. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'd like to ask you today, who do you follow? Now forget the fact that you're in church. Don't give me the Sunday school answer. Who do you follow? Do you follow particular writers? Do you gravitate towards one author or journalist or writer or another? Do you follow certain celebrities? Maybe the Holy Family? Do you follow certain news anchors or news shows or even politicians? Do you follow certain social media sites or channels? Are are there websites that maybe you gravitate towards or you find yourself going every day because you don't feel like you've quite caught up on things until you've visited that site that you follow? You know, whether we admit it or not, people that we follow have a great deal of influence on us. For instance, if you uh, take any pop song that teenagers are really into, there's new language sometimes that appears in songs that has never before been said or sung, and all of a sudden there it is in a song, and nobody even really knows what it means. And then we have to learn this new language, and I guarantee you within the year it will show up in every sitcom on primetime, right? Also, pay attention to what the first lady wears to the inauguration, Whatever designer had a hand in that outfit, their stock is immediately going up the next day, right? So the people that we follow have a great influence on our life. Following someone means, whether we realize this or not, letting them get into our soul. And what I've come today to tell you is that Jesus wants more than believers. Jesus wants disciples. And disciple means follower. Now, there's a problem right off the bat because the word disciple literally means learner. In in the New Testament Greek, the word disciple means learner. But that poses a problem for us because when I say learner to you, what we might think of in our culture is uh, sitting in a desk all facing one direction in a stale room with some kind of expert or professor up front lecturing us so that we can acquire head knowledge right, of what that person knows. That's a learner. Well, in Jesus' day, that's not what a learner was. A learner or a disciple would follow a rabbi or a teacher in order to learn from that person. It wasn't just sitting down and having a conversation. It was, it was actually getting up and walking behind this person. If they had particular rhythms to their life, you would adopt those rhythms. When they ate, you would eat, and what they ate, you would eat. And where they stayed, you would stay, and you would follow this person in order to learn from them. And one of the things that you would learn from a rabbi in Jesus' day was the rabbi's scope of knowledge. Because every rabbi had a certain scope of knowledge. They had certain interpretations of the scriptures. Now, does this sound familiar? I mean, don't we follow people based on what they know and what they think about things and their set of ideology and beliefs? Well, that's how it was in Jesus' day. And they would pick their favorite rabbi. Rabbis had fans. You know, I follow this rabbi or that rabbi, or I interpret this scripture the way rabbi so-and-so does. And in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 29, we find one of the verses that I mentioned two weeks ago when we talked about coming to Jesus. There's a lot of verses in the New Testament where Jesus says, come to me. And in Matthew 11, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Then he says in verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Do you know what the rabbi's scope of knowledge was? Every rabbi had a scope of knowledge, as I mentioned. Do you know what that scope of knowledge was called? It was called their yoke. So two weeks ago, when we looked at this verse, one of the things I told you was that I don't really like the fact that Jesus said, come to me and take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't want a yoke. I don't want a burden. But now I realize what Jesus is saying is, take my yoke upon you. Take the scope of my knowledge. Take my teachings and live by them, and you will find for yourself a more restful life than the things you've been believing. 
and the ways that you've been following. And I believe one of Jesus, one of the biggest pieces of Jesus' scope of knowledge is called the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, because in those three chapters, Jesus sits down on the side of a mountain and starts preaching, and he doesn't stop for three chapters. It's nothing but the teachings of Jesus and the life that he's calling his disciples to and how he interprets the Old Testament law and how we're to live that out and how he calls us to even greater levels of faithfulness and obedience. And And all of that is part of his scope of knowledge. And I believe that's so important that during the season of Lent this year, between February 18th and Easter, we're going to be looking at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be preaching through it for six weeks. We're going to have small groups working through it. We're going to have study guides to give out to any groups that want to study it. We're going to be looking at it in Bible study on Wednesday night. But Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. And what he's saying is, take my teachings Live according to the lifestyle that I'm prescribing, and you will find rest. So following is a crucial step in the Christian journey. And I would say today that I believe it is the hardest. Because taking the step of following Jesus means going from a believer to someone who's actually practicing what we believe. And it's a lot easier to talk the talk than it is to walk the walk. Amen? So we're in this sermon series. For those of you who are just joining us for the first time today or haven't been here for a few weeks, we're in this sermon series called Come, Follow, Go. And the reason it's called Come, Follow, Go is because we're looking at the crux of what Jesus says, the words of invitation Jesus gives to all of us. And those words are come, follow, go. In Matthew 4, 19, Jesus says, come and follow me so that I may send you out to fish for people. So we come to Jesus that we might follow him. We follow him that we might be sent by him, and we go to declare and demonstrate the kingdom of God. And the first week, we talked about how coming to Jesus is very personal, and we all have to take that first step of repentance and faith and come to Jesus. Last week, we talked about the importance of coming together, because the moment that we do that, we're more than a person. We become part of the people of God. And we talked about the sacrifice that God made in Jesus Christ so that we can have full access to him without any barriers or prerequisites. Today, I want to challenge us to think about our sacrifice to God. What will we give up in order to follow Jesus? The verse that we read, Jesus says, anyone who wants to be my disciple has to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Did you know that the moment you said yes to Jesus, if you have said yes to Jesus, you said no, you and I said no to an infinite number of other lives we could have chosen to live. Do you realize that? The minute you say yes to Jesus, and you desire to live a life according to what he has for you, you're saying no to an infinite number of other lives that you could have chosen to lead. I want to look at some other verses in Luke's gospel, chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. This is Luke's version of what we read in Matthew. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whether you're convinced that you should follow Jesus yet or not, I have an audacious claim to make to you this morning. Until you follow Jesus, you will never fully find your true self. You will only find the true self that God made you to be and meant for you to live if you follow Jesus. And there's this crazy paradox that it is only by losing our life for the sake of Jesus that we'll actually find it. But if we spend our whole life trying to find ourselves apart from Jesus, we'll lose it. We'll never find it. Many people like the first step of coming to Jesus. We like the language of uh, come to me. You're welcome. You're accepted as you are. But then Jesus has one more step after that. He, He starts using language like deny. Take up your cross. Die to yourself. Lose your life. And we don't like that so much. Because it's easy to believe in something if that believing entitles you to something. I will believe in Jesus so that I can go to heaven. 
so that I can have eternal life or go to the Father's house where there's many mansions and I hear rumors that there's streets of gold, right? We'll believe in Jesus to get that. But what about when Jesus says to truly follow me, to truly be my disciple, you have to sacrifice, you have to give up, you have to deny that, that the way of Jesus is the way of the cross. It's a way of sacrificial love and self-denial and putting the interests of others above your own. We're choosing to become a student, an apprentice, and a representative of Christ. And a servant is not greater than his master. Further down in Luke's, uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, as they were walking along the road, a man says to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you will go. And I'm sure many of us have said that to Jesus. I'll follow you wherever you'll go. And he says, the son of man, uh, foxes have dens and bird ha birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. That doesn't sound great. <laughs> Sounds like birds and foxes will be better off than those who will follow Jesus. That, that he's a wanderer, that, that uh, his way of life isn't always settled. We don't get to just settle down and enjoy. Someone else comes to him and, and Jesus says, follow me. And the person replies, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Now, that seems reasonable, does it not? I mean, if you have a loved one that, that you want to bury, why would God not let you do that? But, but there's no evidence in the text that the person's father was even close to death. Rather, what the person was speaking of is the responsibility of the eldest son to bury the father and take his place as leader of the family. So that belonging to the family, the son had certain duties, and he was reminding Jesus of these duties and saying, let me attend to these first. But Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. See, the person is saying, I, I want to follow you, but let me remind you where I'm a citizen. I'm a citizen of this family, and I'm a citizen of these people, and I have certain responsibilities. And Jesus is saying, no, if you're a citizen of the kingdom of God, you have a new set of responsibilities, and they come first. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still, another said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. How many of us would love to follow Jesus, but the minute we realize what we have to give up or what needs to change, we want to go spend some time with that just a little longer. <laughs> we, we want to go have a, a ceremony and say goodbye to that because we're not quite ready to part from whatever that is or whoever that is. And Jesus replies, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Man, all of this sounds harsh, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, the gospel is supposed to be good news. What is this? Like, this step is hard. Jesus, why are you talking like this? Well, Christmas a year ago, my family took uh, what is probably one of my favorite vacations. We went to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, in Gatlinburg. And there's a place in Pigeon Forge called the Island. Have you, any of you ever heard of the Island or been there? Well, the Island has these rides, and two of the rides are in this picture, the carousel and the Ferris wheel. And Eden was still young enough that a ride as big as the Ferris wheel was intimidating to her. So Liz took Noah and they went on the Ferris wheel and I took Eden to the carousel because plastic horses were a lot more appealing to her. Why am I telling you this in a sermon about following Jesus? Well, because I think the life Jesus calls us to follow him in is neither a Ferris wheel or a carousel. It's not a fun ride that we get on, and we may feel like we're moving, but we're really not going anywhere. That's not the life Jesus calls us to. Jesus is also not a travel agent. He doesn't hand us a brochure and give us all these teachings that we can never live up to and say, good luck, I hope to see you when the journey's over, if you survive. You know, He's a tour guide. And there's a book that I've, been, that I've read in the past couple of years that's really had a big impact on me. It's called Simple Church. And in Simple Church, they distinguish between a travel agent and a tour guide. And they say this, this difference is best seen in whitewater rafting. There are plenty of travel agents. There are plenty of rafting outfitters from which to choose along a whitewater river trail. A travel agent will mail you brochures. A travel agent will suggest a rafting outfitter and a river to enjoy, but a travel agent's role ends there. 
A travel agent spouts intellectual information, hands you some brochures and smiles. A travel agent tells you to enjoy the journey. Nice to meet you. Have a nice trip. That's their role. A tour guide is different. Along the Ocoee in the Smoky Mountains, there's this great tour guide named Trip. And the name fits because he is literally a trip. He knows each rapid intimately and talks about them with great energy. Double suck. Moonshot. Flipper. Trip enjoys each stage of the journey along the river, and it's fun to hear him share stories about different parts of the journey. And he takes you with him. He knows the information just the same as the travel agents, but that's not what makes you fall in love with the journey. And that's not what inspires you. What inspires you is his passion. What inspires you is the fact that he's taking you to places where he's been before. And he knows those places well. He doesn't instruct at a distance. He's with you. He's on the bus with you from the outfitter to the river. He's in the raft with you. And if things don't go according to plan, he's in the river with you. Trip has been where he's taking you. He's familiar. He speaks from a place of personal authority, and that's why people listen to him. He's not perfect. His boat may flip over with you in it, but he is credible. People need spiritual tour guides, not spiritual travel agents. And I want you to think in your mind, have you ever encountered spiritual travel agents? They're all about telling you about the journey. They're all about handing you information and telling you where you should go and what sites you should visit. But then they say, good luck. They set you on your way. They never invite you to witness them taking the journey. A tour guide is different. A tour guide says, come with me on the journey that I've already been on. And even if we get lost, we'll find our way together. And even if something happens, uh, it may not go perfectly, but I'll be with you. You just put your foot where I put my foot, and we'll do this thing together. What the world really needs is spiritual tour guides. You follow me as I follow Jesus. Or in the words of Paul, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And can I tell you something extremely liberating? The world doesn't need a perfect example. But we do need living ones. We need living examples. If you're worried about our kids and our youth, because I hear a lot of adults talk about how worried they are about our kids and our youth. Our kids and our youth don't need perfect examples. So stop covering up the mess that your life really is because you're trying to spare the children. That's only making it worse. What they need is to see you with all your mess and know that somehow you are still following Jesus. That you are living what you believe, maybe by fits and starts and maybe imperfectly, but that it's possible because then they'll sense your authenticity. They'll sense that it's genuine and they'll want what you have because that's what tour guides do, not travel agents, tour guides. When I was in high school, I watched this video called Dust by a former pastor named Rob Bell. He put out all these videos and I remember being so impacted by what he taught in that video. He talked about how in Jesus' day, rabbis took disciples from the young people. And the disciples were the smart ones. They were the brightest and the most elite. Well, take a look at Jesus' disciples. What were they doing when Jesus found them? Most of them were doing the trade of their father, weren't they? They, they had flunked out of Hebrew school. They weren't, they weren't doing that anymore because the rabbis had passed over them. They had missed their boat. They had become tax collectors or zealots. They were doing other things. And yet Jesus sought them out. Jesus, the guy who at 12 years old was in the temple schooling the older rabbis, he sought out these guys who didn't make the cut. And he said, I want you to come and follow me. What do you think he was saying by doing that? I think what he was saying is those other rabbis may not have taken you because they didn't think that you could do what they did and become what they are. But I want you to come with me because I guarantee you can do what I do. And you can even become what I am. Jesus was making a statement that his yoke, his scope of knowledge, was for everybody. That anybody could do it. You know, there's this story where Jesus uh, is walking on the water and he calls Peter to come out of the boat. And Peter steps out of the boat and begins to walk on the water. But then he starts sinking. And I've learned that 
it wasn't Jesus Peter was doubting. Jesus did not sink. Jesus was standing on the water. Peter didn't doubt Jesus because Jesus never went anywhere. He was proving that he could do it. What, what Peter started doubting was Peter. See, Peter was looking at his rabbi, and disciples are supposed to do what their rabbis are doing. So when, when the rabbi says, come, the disciple comes. When the rabbi says, go, the disciple goes. So Peter was being obedient, but all of a sudden, Peter started thinking, maybe I can't do what my disciple does. I mean, my rabbi does. Maybe I can't be what my rabbi is. And that's when he started sinking. How many of us do the same thing? How many of us look at Jesus and, and hear what Jesus teaches and read the Bible or come to church and we hear these expectations and we think, I can't do that. I can't live up to all that. And so we settle for some half gospel that maybe we're just forgiven, but we're always doomed to just be sinners. Thank God he just takes us as we are. When Jesus is looking at us going, no, you can do this. I called you to be my disciple because I know you can do it. Just do what I do and follow me. And if you remain focused on me, I promise you can do this. Even you can do this. Jesus reminded his disciples in John chapter 15, I did not, you did not choose me. I chose you. Remember when you start questioning yourself, you did not choose me. I chose you. I came after you. And if I came after you and invited you to be my disciple, that means that it's possible. It means you can do it. I'm giving you the power to do it. So there's this old Jewish blessing that Rob Bell shared in that video that I watched in high school called Dust. And lots of other pastors have shared it too. Ray Vanderland had a Sunday school video lesson on it. And it has its roots in ancient Judaism in the Talmud. And the blessing goes like this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. The idea is that when we're following our rabbi, our rabbi is kicking up dust. And we want to follow so closely that the dust of his feet gets on us. That we begin to look like him. That we don't follow at a distance, but we put our foot everywhere he steps, that we go every place he goes. When he starts going that way, we don't stop at mile marker seven and say, I'll meet you at the cutoff because I'm not interested in going there. Disciples follow everywhere, knowing that their master, their rabbi goes before them. Jesus is going to call you to places you don't want to go. And that doesn't necessarily mean leaving, by the way. It may mean Jesus is calling you to places in your own neighborhood that you have never stepped foot, even though you've lived there for a very long time. It may mean Jesus is calling you into certain groups of people or circles of influence that you just don't want to go by yourself. But Jesus goes before you, and, a, and if you are a disciple, you must follow him there. Jesus is going to call us to do things as a church, and my prayer is that all of us would be dusty, that our church would become a dusty church. That it wouldn't just be a place where people come and hear about the trip like we're travel agents, but they never see us living out what we're talking about. I pray that we would become a church that has a reputation of following so closely behind our rabbi that his dust gets on us, that we look like Jesus more every day, that we're actually making disciples. You know, when Jesus said at the end of Matthew's gospel, go make disciples, who was he talking to? His disciples, right? But he told his disciples, go make disciples. You know what that means? It means there's no such thing as a disciple who doesn't make disciples. You can't be a disciple if you don't make disciples. Jesus makes disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. So my question for us is, what are we doing to make disciples? Where are we following Jesus? And how are we helping other people to follow Jesus? Because if there are ways that we're not doing those things, then we're neglecting part of the call, part of the invitation, and part of the challenge that Jesus has for us. So look at your own life. Look at the places in which you serve in the church. Look at your places of influence. Look at the places you've dared not go. And ask yourself, have I been left in my master's dust? <laughs> Do I need to follow him more closely? Is there some new place he's calling me to go? And my prayer for you is that you would be covered in the dust of your rabbi. Let's pray. 
Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that you saw fit to call each one of us, that even today you are inviting all of us to follow you. There is so much, Lord, that we don't feel capable of doing. We don't feel capable of being godly people, of being Christ-like people. We don't feel capable of suggesting that anybody would imitate us as we imitate Jesus. But that's exactly the life that you've called us to. Lord, help us today to put our trust in you. Help us today to surrender anything we've been holding back, like any of those other people that came to you and said, I'll follow you, but I'll follow you, but first let me do this. I'll follow you, but let me hang on to this. Lord, I pray that today, if there's any of us that have not fully surrendered our life to you, we would do so right now in this moment. God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us by his blood, to wash us and make us new. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that you give to us by whom we become new and every day that we're transformed more in the likeness of Jesus. We turn our lives and our wills over to you so that your will would become our will. What you want becomes what we want. We pray that your priorities and your agenda would rule and lead our lives and that you would show us exactly where you want us to go and give us the courage to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together. And the altars will be open if you want to come and spend some time in prayer.